So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Joshua Fox Fuller. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're pleased that you can join us for this lecture today in our volume four of the 12 week No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from different experts in the field covering different topics. This lecture series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free, high quality didactic opportunities. We'd like to be sure to thank our financial sponsors for your generous support of No Neuropsychology. And before we begin with today's lecture, we just have a couple of disclaimers. So this training is, um, and the lectures that we do are not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. In terms of some logistics today, we ask that you submit questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which we will um, handle during a moderated Q&A session at the end of the talk. And there's a recording of this uh, session that's being done right now that will be posted on the No Neuropsychology website later this week. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to honor and um, welcome Dr. Adam Gersenecker for today's lecture uh, about cognitive, functional, and psychiatric features of progressive supranuclear palsy. So Dr. Gersenecker is an assistant professor of neurology in the Division of Neuropsychology at the University of Alabama, Alabama at Birmingham. And he earned his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Louisville. After that, he completed his internship and postdoctoral fellowship at UAB. Clinically, Dr. Gersenecker has an extensive experience working in the assessment of cognitive and functional ability with patients for, who have a wide array of neurological disorders with particular specialties in PD and atypical forms of Parkinsonism. His primary research experiences have been in the areas of neuropsychology and geropsychology, and he has particular experience in investigations involving patients with Parkinsonism. Dr. Grossnecker has published numerous articles outlining the cognitive, behavioral, and functional aspects of PD and related disorders, such as progressive supranuclear palsy, many of which have been published in top tier journals like neurology and movement disorders. Dr. Grossnecker also has been awarded a K23 for investigating hippocampal internal architecture and inflammatory mechanisms in multiple sclerosis. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, welcome Dr. Gersenecker to begin his presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, welcome everybody. It's a little weird because I can't see any of you, but um, welcome everyone I can't see. So today I'm going to be talking about PSP, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. Really, I'm going to be outlining some studies that I was involved in. Um, back when I was in graduate school and a postdoc. Um, like was said, I, I do my work with MS now, um, but I used to be heavily involved with PSP. So I'm gonna outline these studies because I give, I, I think it gives a good indication of um, the, the, what, pe what people with PSP look like when we test them um, in the clinic. So here are my disclosures. I don't have any. Um, Here's what my disclosures I, I wish looked like. I wish I had a lot of them, but I don't. Uh, so PSP is a tauopathy, which is also a, a chronic neurodegenerative disorder. Um, prevalence is about 6.4 per 100,000. People usually get this in their, in their 50s and 60s. Um, you will find some people who get it a little bit later, but it's usually towards the trend towards the 60s. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's a pretty nasty disorder and people die within five to 10 years of getting it. And it really takes a toll on a person. Very different from Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease in that way. Um, so people usually die uh, a little bit after symptom, five to 10 years after symptom onset, but two to four years from diagnosis because a lot of these people are initially diagnosed with Parkinson's disease or with nothing at all. Um, Symptoms are usually disturbance of the balance. Uh, there's impaired mobility. As the name suggests, there's, there's difficulties with gaze or, or orienting the eyes. <clears throat> and there's also difficulties with talking and swallowing. Now, when you see someone with PSP, actually, let me put this on the speaker view. If I can. Let me stop share here real quick so I can switch this to the speaker view for the slideshow. Okay, now then I don't know how to do this. Okay, let me see here. So how would I, 
get this on the slideshow and also be able to share my screen. So you're interested in seeing your notes? No, not at all. I can just do it from the thing. But you guys, you guys are seeing all the stuff on the side and everything too, right? Uh, we're just seeing just basically the PowerPoint. But if you go in um, on the top, where it says yeah. from current slide right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. That should be able to do it. Let's okay. See. So, oh, yeah, I, it, it looks good now. Thank you. So when you see someone in the clinic, um, usually what you'll see to start, this gives a breakdown of the chronology of deficits. Usually the people will initially have some gait difficulty. A lot of times it won't be too intrusive and they'll just think it's something to do with age, um, but then they'll start to have the visual symptoms. And that's usually because uh, of difficulty orienting the eyes. And then there's difficulty with uh, talking and swallowing. Eventually the person will need aid to walk, become wheelchair bound or, or be in a wheelchair and become um, in, the, in their bed. Uh, PSP, it's known, it's atrophy is, is subcortical. So there's tangles in the basal ganglia, diencephalon, brainstem, that lead to a lot of neuronal loss. There's minimal, minimal pathology in um, the cortices, but you will find some in the motor areas. Um, some cases of PSP, they've tied to uh, polymorphisms in the MAPT gene, which is a tau gene. Uh, but most cases of PSP, they don't know what causes it. So this is someone who has trouble with vertical gaze. You can't tell from the picture, but they're actually trying to make this gentleman look up. But if he does the dowel head maneuver, it goes like this, he can move his eyes up a little bit. So if you have a pin in front of the person and you're trying to get them to follow the pin, they'll get stuck and won't be able to go up. That's the supranuclear gaze palsy. But then if they move their head, this is how they're gonna have to read or do other things like that. And then on this, I have a video. So I'm going to um, share because there are also things other than just gaze palsy that you'll see when you do like a neurobehavior status exam and you try to get them to follow a pin or something. So I'm gonna show up a little bit of that right now. Forward gaze. All of these saccadic intrusions are not nystagmus, they're actually square wave jerks. There's a fast phase that takes the eyes above the target, and the boundary phase is the same as right there. So there is a distinction between Dr. Gersenecker, I don't think the audio is coming through, but if you just want to narrate or tell us what's going on, that's fine. So okay. Just, um, so I just heard that the audio is not coming through. So what happens is there's there's not smooth pursuit. As you can see, it looks like they're saccades, but they're not. Um, so the person's actually trying to follow a pen right now. This is somebody who would be in some of the later stages of the disease. As you can see, he's trying to follow the pen. And right now he's actually trying to read. You see the eyes jumping when he does that. And you can just see him continuing to try to read. And this is, this is the dial's head maneuver where the eyes just kind of rotate up and down in the sockets as opposed to the person being able to move them. Now I need to... I think you're muted now. We can unmute you though. <laughs> oh, do you hear me now? Sorry. About that. We hear you now. You're good. Yep. Okay. So when you look at MRI, what what is usually referred to as the Mickey Mouse sign, um, and in persons with PSP, and this is how 
quite a few people are initially identified. They'll go in and, and be complaining of Parkinsonism. Um, and then they'll give them an MRI and they'll see some sort of version of the Mickey Mouse sign. And that's just a reduction of midline midbrain diameter. And as you can see, you see this on axial imaging. And as you can see, it, it does kind of look like Mickey Mouse there. Um, so when we're talking about cognition in PSP, this was really a, a initially referred to as kind of a classic subcortical dementia. Um, where you have significant deficits in fluency and, and a lot of executive problems and information processing is slow, but there was thought to be limited involvement of memory and language. So one of the things we wanted to do when we set out with some of our studies was to see if, if this actually held up. Um, so now this was, a, this was a study I worked on in grad school. I was pretty involved with uh, the PI was Irene Litvan. We tested 350 persons with PSP um, using NINDS as PSP criteria. I'm gonna talk more about that later because it's important. Um, we wanted to rule out frank dementia. So, you know, we just gave the MMSC as a crude measure. Um, I didn't pick, I didn't pick the, the neuropsych tests. I would have put in a lot more verbal fluency, but the neuropsych tests that, that were given was the DRS, um, the frontal assessment battery or the FAB the CVLT to short form and the BNC. You know, we use norms, we're neuropsychologists here. So of course we use norms, uh, correcting for age and education. Um, impairment scores, since different people have different impairment scores, which is interesting, um, but at or below the fifth percentile for mild and at or below the first percentile for severe. We also gave the progressive supranuclear palsy rating scale and the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. That's the PSPRS and the UPDRS. Um, and these are measures of kind of Parkinsonian severity. They have different subscales, um, but you can also group them for a total score. Here's the demographics. So the age of the participants was 68. Um, we actually had a pretty even split between males and females, but usually when you see studies, you'll see a lot more males. It's kind of hard to get females. So this, this was a, a good part of the study was that we, we got a lot of females in it. Like most studies at, at academic medical centers, um, education, the, the group was pretty well educated. Disease duration was 3.8 years, and that was disease duration. That wasn't time since diagnosis. Um, so it's a bit suggest, suggest, subjective. Um, but disease burden, if you just go by years, would be lower. And then the UPDRS total and the PSPRS total are both kind of indicative of about moderate disease, disease severity. So here's performance on the measures. So if you look at DRS total, you had about 42% impaired at the fifth percentile and about 23% impaired at the first percentile. Um, the Subtest with the most impairment was IP, 54% at the fifth percentile and about 31% at the first percentile. You see construction, you also have quite a bit of impairment, but just, just, not, as much, just not as much as IP. Um, on the FAB, that's where we saw the most impairment. Now, for those who don't know what the FAB is, um, it's, it's a test that supposedly taps frontal ability and it has motor and non-motor features. So like one is as like saying as many letters or many words that begin with a certain letter, but there's also like go, go no go. And you're looking for, for pre prehensile behaviors, things like that. Um, a lot of impairment on that. So 63% at the fifth and 54% at the first. Uh, memory, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide showed an interesting pattern. Uh, but as you see, there was a lot more people impaired at the fifth than the first, and then relatively small for conceptualization and the BNT. So here's the memory scores, and it's, it's a bit of an interesting pattern because initially people thought that there was not a lot of memory impairment in, in PSP. But if you look um, at the initial trial, you know, a, a quarter of the participants showed impairment. But then as it went along, that number kept coming down. So total recall, if you look at 
percentage in Parita at the first percentile has really gone down about 10 points. Now, then if you go to short delay free recall, it's gone down even more. And at the first percentile is down to just 4% of the sample. Long delay recall, it's gone down even more. And it's just 2% of the sample. If you look at the numbers, so if you look at trial four, 6.5 uh, is the average number of words that, that the group got. It only dropped to 5.9 in, in short delay and then only 5.1 in long delay. So, and then there, there wasn't a lot of benefit from queuing here either. So there's an initial slowed acquisition, slowed learning acquisition, but what words the people are able to get, they're able to keep. Um, so yeah, there is some memory impairment, but it looks like with repetition, the people can learn and keep a hold of those memories. So when we were talking about number of tests impaired, uh, there was only, only about a quarter of the sample did not show impairment on any test. Uh, on one test, there was 30, about 31% of the sample was impaired on one test. On two tests, about 28% of the sample. And on three plus tests, about 17% of the sample. So the, the take home point is that there is a lot of cognitive impairment in this group. Um, and like I say, with, when we talk about with the MMSE, if you're looking at a general population of people with PSP, it's probably going to be a lot more because we found impairment in about 75% of the sample of people who scored above 24 on the MMSE. Now, you're going to get a lot of people in the clinic who score below 24 on the MMSE. Executive dysfunction dominated the clinical picture. Uh, now, that would probably change if they would have given stronger verbal fluency measures, but we didn't. Um, relatively strong short and long delay free recall, little, little benefit from queuing. When we looked at if executive function was, was correlated with anything, we did find it was correlated with quite a few of the individual subtests of the PSPRS and the UPDRS. And a big take home point is we can't just look at the motor symptoms in this, in this patient population. We need to look at the cognitive symptoms as well. So the next thing we looked at was relationship between cognition and genetics. So a 2011 GWAS from, from Hoglinger and colleagues uh, found several single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, I'm not a geneticist, but I think a SNP can be best described as like a deletion or a change at a certain allele. So like putting in a T instead of a C or a C instead of a T. And they mapped those on to MAPT genes, MOBP, and a few other ones. And remember, MAPT is, is associated with tau. Um, also looked at APOE, and they noticed that certain alleles of APOE were reduced. So what we did was look to see if cognition varied according to any of those SNPs, or really the relationship between any of those SNPs and cognition. Um, the same, same testing as for the initial study, but we, it was only done for, a, it was done for a smaller number, but still a whole lot when you're talking about PSP. Uh, so results, we didn't find any demographic variables or Parkinsonian severity vary according to any of those SNPs. So yeah, these people have the SNPs. It seems like people with these certain SNPs uh, are more likely to get PSP, but it wasn't associated with the PSP, RS, or the UPDRS. Um, but what we did find was that people who had um, the H1C subhaplotype on MAPT uh, had better general cognitive function, attention, and executive function. And it was just the H1C subhaplotype. We didn't find it for any other subhaplotype on, on MAPT. Uh, we did follow-up analyses to see if we could find uh, mitigators or moderators for this, and we didn't. Uh, nothing varied according to demographic factors or other factors. It still held up, um, and no other significant differences were found on any of the other genes. We then thought, okay, so everyone who is interested in cognition is obviously interested in APOE4. 
Um, so we combined APO, first off, APOE4 by itself was not associated with reduced cognition in this group. So then we looked to see if we combined APO, APOE4 with MAPT H1C, if it would affect it, and it did not. So it looks like MAPT H1C was pretty protective. Here's just a bar graph that shows that for each test on the DRS that we gave, that the mean scores for people with the H1C subhaplotype, whether it's, it's heterozygous or homozygous, um, were better. And with those first three are the ones where we found significant differences. So what about H1, MAPT H1? So MAPT H1 in previous studies has been associated with cognition and has been shown to increase transition from MCI to dementia. Um, we found that that cognition did vary according to MAPT or, or the tau gene in our, in our sample, but that H1C, if the people had this particular polymorphism if in the H1C, that this acted as a protective factor. We then looked at behavioral abnormalities in PSP. And um, one of the questions is, so we, we as, as neuropsychologists, we're very well versed in looking for cognition. One of the questions is, well, why would we also be interested in behavior or behavioral features? Um, one reason is it can help with differential diagnosis. So in, in an earlier study, um, we found that, there, it's found that uh, people with PSP when you look at their behavioral features, look like people with dementias of the frontal lobe, mostly negative symptoms, things like apathy, aspontaneity, indifference, with apathy being particularly dominant. Um, in, in a 1996 study that Dr. Lipman did, they were able to differentiate 85% of patients with PSP from those with the more cortical dementia, something like Alzheimer's disease. And this was not even using cognition. This was just using behavioral features. Um, another reason that you would want to look at behavioral features, especially in PSP, is that apathy and depression are often confused. Uh, and this can lead to people being treated for depression, which is not productive if, if you don't have it, or given antidepressants, which again is not productive if you don't have it. Another reason is we're very focused on the patient, but a lot of times we seem to lose focus of the caregiver. And if you are the caregiver for someone with uh, behavioral features, it can place a lot of burden on you. It can cause you to have depression and it can also lead to the patient being institutionalized faster than people who don't have significant behavioral features. So the methods for this study is the same sample. I, I think the number is 202. Um, it's hidden by me, which is kind of weird. Uh, what we did was we, we gave the neuropsychiatric inventory or the MPI as well when we, when we gave all the other stuff, but this was given to caregivers. So that's why the sample size was reduced because we had to have somebody who, who knew the person well enough or who basically was in the same house and taking care of them. Um, so the NPI looks at 10 domains, um, delusions, hallucinations, agitation, depression, anxiety, euphoria, apathy, disinhibition, irritability, and aberrant motor behavior. Also looks at sleep behaviors and, and, and deviations in appetite and eating, but these aren't included in the total score. They're just kind of freestanding uh, subscales. So the sample looked pretty much like the first sample, 68 years. We still had a pretty good split between males and females, highly educated. Symptom duration went up about 0.2. Um, UPDRS and PSPRS still showed about moderate disease burden. Um, DRS was about 124. The FAB was pretty well elevated like it, it was with most people. And then MMSE was about 27. So this, uh, this table shows each of the domains of the NPI and it's listed by total number of people who were showed um, elevations on those domains. So the first thing you see was, as we expected, apathy. There was a lot of apathy. 61% of the, of the sample 
was rated as having significant apathy with um, 27% in the mild range and 8% in the severe range. Uh, we also found a lot of depression. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, which was a bit of a surprise, um, almost as much as apathy. So one of the questions is gonna be, well, are those the same people? We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Also a lot of uh, trouble sleeping, troubles at night, um, disordered eating, which, which isn't surprising because of the swallowing difficulties. Now, if you look at this next group, this is particularly distressing to caregivers. So you found a lot of people with agitation, a lot of people with irritability, and a lot of people with disinhibition. Um, so 39%, 35%, 33%, um, or 35%, 33%, 31%. That's going to be people who are very difficult for caregivers to manage. And this is one of the reasons why it's good to look at behaviors because you can identify these people and try to get the caregivers into appropriate groups or get appropriate referrals for the patients so they don't wind, wind up institutionalized or the caregiver doesn't wind up with burnout or significant depression. Down at the bottom, you can see one of the, one of the ways you can know if you don't have an atypical Parkinsonism or someone with PSP is usually they will not have hallucinations or delusions. They're, they're fairly rare. So when we're talking about depression, um, as I said, this was a bit surprising. Uh, so we went back and we tried to figure out if, if these numbers were legitimate. So uh, Dr. Litvan had, had me run a lot of extra analyses with these. And we, and we found out that 14 of the people who were rated as depressed, yeah, they were noted as crying easily. But they were also noted as, as crying at inappropriate times. And these same 14 people were also noted as having elation or euphoria. So these people probably had labile emotion and it wasn't pure organic depression. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But still, even then, the numbers would be high. Um, neither age, education, or age of, age of symptom onset or disease duration were, were correlated with any of those totals. It really looked like behavioral features were on their own. They weren't, they weren't correlated with age, weren't correlated with education, they weren't correlated with disease factors, they weren't correlated with um, cognition. The only NPI subscale that was correlated with anything was disinhibition, and, and it was significantly correlated with the PSPRS total score. Um, nothing else at the 0.01 level. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind, since we were talking about depression and apathy, is that they were not significantly associated, just a 0.12 association between those two. So let's imagine you're a caregiver, and you know, most of these caregivers are spouses. I, I think we had a smattering of, of people who were adult children, but you're trying to do your best for this person, and they just don't seem to appreciate anything. They don't want to have anything to do with family activities. They don't want to go anywhere. Um, they just don't seem to really care about anything. Uh, first off, you might think this person is depressed and, and not apathetic. So you could be getting this person uh, antidepressants, um, have them in, in family treatment with you, have them in treatment by themselves. And another thing you might think is that, what am I doing wrong? Is this my fault? Am, am I, am, does this person not like me anymore? Do they think I'm not doing things correctly? Um, so talking to caregivers about this particular behavioral feature of apathy and letting them know that, that this is because of changes in the brain. This has nothing to do with you. And this likely is not depression. Once you tease out if this is depression or apathy is, is pretty important and can really help caregivers normalize this and feel better and have a better outlook at their home situation. Now, there's been some people who think apathy and depression are linked. Um, there's a little bit of debate in the literature about this. So there's a, a smaller camp who say they're linked and there's, there's a larger camp who say, no, they're, they're clearly different. Um, in, in our particular study, we found that depression and apathy were, were not correlated and shared only about 1% of variance. <clears throat> also, there was only 13 of the sample who were rated as exhib exhibiting moderate to severe symptoms of both apathy and depression. And then when you think about depression, you almost always think about anxiety. The two pretty much go hand in hand. 
Um, we, we saw this in, in the correlations that we did. Depression was highly correlated with anxiety. However, when we looked at apathy, we found that apathy was not significantly correlated with anxiety. So the take home from that is it looked like these were distinct syndromes in our sample, or at least based upon our correlations. So when we ran the depression numbers, um, Dr. Lipman was really surprised by them being so high and being anywhere close to apathy because in previous studies, depression was, was noted as, as being fairly low in people with PSP and apathy was actually a little bit higher. Um, and, but another reason she was basing this was on the mechanistic or, or the anatomical structures because uh, the circuits associated with depression aren't affected in PSP are far less affected than PSP, but the circuits associated with apathy, they are affected quite a bit. So this was puzzling to her, but then she's a neurologist. So if you look at it as a clinical psychologist, you would say, okay, yeah, well, maybe it's not because of disruptions to the brain. Maybe it's because of all the other stuff that's going on. These people have decreased mobility. They've lost a lot of independence. Um, I mean, their, their lives have totally changed. So it's likely that these levels of depression that we were getting weren't directly related to PSP itself or the physiological changes. They, they were related to the changes in, in mobility and functioning and things like that. Um, so that leads you to think, well, maybe we should be trying psychotherapy with these people or doing some trials on antidepressants with patients with PSP. There, a lot of that really hasn't been done. Um, you know, maybe you could utilize caregivers for these treatments and make quality of life better for both of them. I think these are all avenues for further study if, if anyone was ever so inclined. So the next thing we looked at was uh, functional ability in PSP. Now, as we all know, there's two different types. When we talk about functional ability, we're talking about ADLs and IEDLs. ADLs are more basic things like bathing, grooming, dressing. Um, IEDLs are higher order, things like financial management, medica medication management, and driving. So when a person with PSP goes into a neurology office, they're usually given the PSPRS, the UPDRS, um, and the Schwab and England scale, which is, which is part of the UPDRS. That thing is really crude. Um, but these scales are, are used pretty well across the board in research, clinical trials, and in the clinic. Why is this important? Well, one, because if you're diagnosing someone with dementia, the trouble with the functional ability is supposed to be because of cognitive impairment. It's not supposed to be because of, of motor trouble. Um, this has treatment implications. Um, like medications, uh, medication options and referrals for support, supportive services. It also has implications for clinical trials because you don't want to get people with dementia in the clinical trials. And the FDA gives preference to outcome measures that have look at functional ability to begin with. Um, so we wanted to see if the functional scales that are commonly used correlated with motor or if they correlated with cognition. Um, what we found was that, no surprise, 100% of the sample was rated as having some, some level of functional disability on all of these scales that are dimmed However, every single functional scale was correlated with motor symptoms at the 0.01 level. So it looks like these were primarily driven by motor. Um, I don't think I need to go through this in detail. This is just another chart of the subsample that we used. It's pretty much the same pattern. So here's a bar graph showing what the ratings look like on these scales. So it looks like they're, they're more tipped in sort of the moderate range here for the PSPRS. Same sort of pattern for the UPDRS ADL, ADL scale, kind of in the moderate range. And then for the Schwab in England, a um, few people at, at the lower levels and then kind of in the mid range a lot and then not very many at the lower end of functional ability. When we look at correlations, we see that the ADL scales were correlated with each other. 
also correlated with motor, highly correlated with motor, but not very well correlated with cognition. Um, so we concluded that, that what is termed functional disability in this patient's sample is primarily due to physical disability and not due to cognitive impairment. Um, and when we, if we would have looked at these scales in combination with our cognitive measures, every single person in our sample would have been diagnosed with dementia. Um, so this leads to some questions. Are these functional scales sensitive to detect functional changes? Uh, can a diagnosis of dementia be made using these scales? Should a diagnosis of, de be, of dementia be made using these scales? Um, so really this was I, a grant I did while I was a postdoc. Um, I used that information to get a grant from Cure PSP where we took uh, 13 people with PSP and 13 caregivers and we gave them a brief neuropsychological battery and then administered performance based IADMDL measures that looked at medical decision-making, financial decision-making, and the ability to communicate and use a phone. We didn't cut them off for MMSE because I wanted to look at a more representative sample and because it's, it's super hard to, uh, to recruit people with PSP and I only had two years to do it. And all diagnoses of PSP were made by a movement disorder neurologist here at UAP. Sample was 66, pretty well educated. Um, we were not able to get very many females for this one, so they were majority male, all Caucasian. Disease duration was 3.3 years, and the PSP RS total was again in the moderate range. So even with the performance based, we found that about 80% of the sample had some sort of functional disability or some sort of functional impairment um, when looking at a normative sample. However, if you compare that to what we just showed previously when we used the normal functional scales, it was 100%. So it's definitely an improvement. Um, we found that medical decision-making was particularly impaired. And before I had come to UAB, they did a study where they looked at medical decision-making in Parkinson's disease, dementia, and, and the rates were, were very, very close. Financial decision-making was also poor. And one thing that was pretty interesting with the financial measure was that uh, the persons with PSP were very susceptible to fraud and scam. So it looked like they'd be pretty easy to take advantage of. Um, we also found that a little more than 50% of the sample wasn't able to call 911 and accurately convey what the emergency was. So that has implications for autonomy and leaving them alone. Um, and then the IADL performance on these tests was highly driven by executive function and attention. So the CCTI was the medical decision-making test that we used. And this is just a slide to show that uh, R squared was 0.52 if we gave in composite scores for executive function and attention. Here we look at the correlations and you can see that cognition was associated with our scale of medical decision-making or scale of financial decision-making, but not with the caregiver reports. And the caregiver reports were not associated with any of the performance-based measures. Um, so basically this is just a recap. We already said the first point. Uh, the second point, the mean correlations were higher for each performance-based measure than for any of the caregiver reports. The mean correlations were higher for cognition. Um, we also looked to see if these were significantly higher, and we found that they were if we looked at Steger's, Steiger's Z. Um, when we looked at fact scores, we found that the correlations between the performance-based measures, each one was significantly higher than the correlation between fact scores and cognition. Um, the scores on the performance-based measures did not correlate with PSPRS or disease duration. However, they were significantly correlated with the cognitive measures. So what do you conclude from this? Well, caregiver report is not a reliable method of evaluating daily function of PSP. They're gonna base it on how they're doing with motor stuff. Um, they're not gonna be able to look through that and tell you, yeah, they could do this if it wasn't for the motor. Uh, this, ham this, this really hampers our ability to be able to give accurate diagnosis of MCI and dementia. And about 
recommendations of appropriate levels of support unless we further dig into how well they're doing on those functional abilities. Uh, so, and this also shows that current methods of tapping functional abilities in drug trials are suboptimal. They're, the, the scores they're getting back that are telling them if these drugs are doing any good, they're just not valid. So let, let me give a few words on, on PSP phenotypes. So this, this reference needs to be updated. So about a year ago, two years ago, these things actually came out in, in the publication, which showed that there's a ton of different PSP phenotypes. So there's PSP Richardson syndrome, which is about 55%, PSP Parkinsonism, about 30%, PSP frontal dementia, about 5%, PSP ocular motor, about 1%, PSP pure akinesia with gait freezing, 1%. PSP cortical basal syndrome, 1%. Interestingly enough, there's also a, a subset of people with cortical basal syndrome who show features of PSP. So that's a difficult one to uh, differentially diagnose. Uh, PSP progressive non-fluent aphasia, about 1%. Uh, PSP cerebellar, about 1%. And then there's a remaining few percent that are combinations of those are still unrecognizable. Now, the thing to point out here is that up until about a year or two ago, all the diagnostic criteria for PSP were based on a paper that um, Irene Litvan put out, I think in 1996. And all of these were almost all, almost all Richardson syndrome. So most of the information that's out there on PSP is about Richardson syndrome. So really all the cognitive stuff, all the behavioral stuff, well, not all of it, but most of it is based upon one phenotype of PSP. So there's a lot of work to do trying to tease out what these other phenotypes look like and what the cognition looks like. Um, we, we tried to do cluster analyses with our sample of 350 people and we really couldn't, we couldn't cluster it out. So we just came to the conclusion that, that most of them were, were PSP Richardson syndrome. And so the stuff I presented is most applicable to Richardson syndrome. It might be apl applicable to the other stuff, but more research needs to be uh, done to know that. Um, so I've tested a ton of people with PSP. I don't, I don't even know how many. Um, it, it can be tricky because of the trouble with the eye movement. So you really need to accommodate the when you're testing a person with PSP. So a lot of times you might have to hold the stimuli up um, need to make sure they're in a comfortable position. You can use props or like uh, one of those small podiums that can fit on a desk so you can bring the materials closer up to them. A lot of times you might need to get on their side of the table and flip the things because the stuff's raised. But there is accommodations that sometimes need to be made when you're testing someone with PSP, especially when they're at the later stages or if they have RS, Richardson syndrome, and are having significant trouble moving their eyes. And that's about all I got. So I can take questions now. Looks like we got about 16 minutes and I will stop sharing. Great, thank you so much um, for joining us today to talk about PSP. I feel like I was actually talking a little bit with one of my mentors. Um, I don't know if you know Alice Cronenglom up here in Boston University who does a lot of work in Parkinson's disease. And I saw, I, we were talking a little bit about how um, PSP is, you know, not, I mean, for someone like yourself, it seems like it's a very common disorder that you see in your, um, patients or your population, but it's not typically talked about. So I think this lecture will be a great resource and tool. And it's great to hear about some of your research. Um, so I think we have, so we have a few questions, um, from the, uh, from the audience. So you talked some about, I think toward the end, especially about these different phenotypes and how uh -huh. that creates some probably a good degree of challenge in differential diagnosis on top of the clinical syndrome being um, a bit unique in itself. But um, I we're wondering if you can just comment a little bit more on it. Um, one thing I kind of took away, so it sounds like you're saying from your research that uh, hallucinations, for example, might be more indicative of like another condition more likely than PSP. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can just comment a little bit more on sort of the questions you might ask in like a clinical interview or sort of how you go about that differentiation process. Usually we're not going to be the ones who differentiate PSP. I mean, I, I always give a neurobehavioral status exam where I will look at, um, try to look for things like Valent syndrome, 
um, or or I, I always look if you know have them follow the pen. I have them read and follow their eyes to look at the saccades. Um, usually, it's going to be a movement disorder neurologist who makes that determination. Now, there's been a couple of times where I've gotten people from general neurology and and been able to say, yeah, I think that's PSP. Uh, but that's that's fairly rare. So it's it's usually not going to be us who does that. Okay. So I guess as a follow up to that, then um, what do you how do you, how do you view the role of the neuropsychologist in um, the de- I guess like the modern FPSP? Can you speak a little bit more to that? I think well we can classify the deficits and help with the functioning, help with the caregivers. Kind of the things I pointed out where we can say what sort of level of independence they, they are having, what sort of things they can be doing at the time, um, questions about placement, uh, education, things, things of, along that nature. Mm-hmm. So I guess in many ways, it's, um, for lack of a better word or better way of phrasing it, kind of integrating the psychology side of neuropsychology into the picture, it seems like a pretty heavy part of the equation for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now what we can do, I mean, if you get someone in with, now, someone would be like, I think this is an atypical Parkinsonism. Is this PSP? Is this CBD? Now that you can, you can kind of dig in a little bit more. Um, but you'll, be need, you'll probably need to be pointed in that direction because usually we're not going to see these people early anyway. It's going to be a little later in the disease stage. Right. Yeah, it seems, it seems like um, from, I guess, so it kind of ties in a little bit with the next question. So it seems like it's a very rapidly progressing disorder relative to some other uh-huh. neurodegenerative conditions, but that the early on, the early pieces of it are not necessarily like hallmark signs that bring somebody to the clinic right away. It's until like the middle part, it seems of the course. Um, yeah. But we got a question kind of, uh, and you might have talked about this earlier on in the talk, but can you clarify or elaborate some on some of the epidemiological pieces? Like if there's a sex or um, if there's any known racial or any demographic prevalences that you're aware of? Uh, it's more common in men. Um, I don't know about racial. I don't know if there's been good studies on that. Um, so that I can't answer, but it is more common in men. Um, but that's, that's Parkinson's disease in general. Um, you know. Yeah. So it fa- sort of falls into that same sort of epidemiological piece for Parkinson's disease. Um, and then I think uh, in terms of maybe one more question that we might have before we wrap up, um, I know you're not a geneticist. I wish we could all be experts on everything. That would be a lot of fun. Um, but when you spoke about those, uh, the SNPs, there was a question, um, of talking about, I don't know, I don't know if you know the prevalence on this, but in terms of SNP contributions, how do you know kind of if it's like, if there's a certain prevalence of that, or if like one SNP is sort of, if there's an additive value, multiple SNPs contribute to increased risk or anything like that? So I think the MAPTH1, we, it was probably in, let me see. I think it was in like 200 and probably in like 80 to 85% of our sample. I'd have to go back and look at the paper. Mm -hmm. So that was highly predictive. I, I think that was the one that really stood out that if people had this particular um, allele that they were more likely to have PSP. Uh, I would suggest that person, I think if they could go back and, and look at the publication, it's in there, but, um, this definitely the MAPD, MAPT gene is highly associated with certain, certain, certain sub haplotypes on there are highly associated with PSP. Awesome. Um, I think those are the main questions that we got. So I appreciate, um, first of all, you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come share some of your knowledge with us about PSP and uh, some of the highlights from the work that you've done. It's really, I really enjoyed it. I hope I speak for everyone <laughs> in saying that. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Gersenecker. Just a quick comment to the audience. So next week's lecture um, will be at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. And Dr. Elena Soy, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, San Francisco, will be talking about computerized cognitive aging um, for the tracking and monitoring of dementia. So a nice compliment to some of the lectures that we have now. And we'll also have pediatric topics in the future um, lectures as well this volume. So thank you so much, Dr. Gerson Necker and everyone for joining us. I hope you have a good rest of your Monday. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And if you're around, you can just stop the recording. <laughs>